Hello, I am Sabrina Medeiros. I am PhD in political science and uh, the research lead at the Interagency Institute. We are very glad to receive you here today as part of our joint event. We're, we are doing, uh, organizing this event together with Plataforma Hello, C Hello, I am Sabrina Medeiros. Uh, Plataforma Cipop, and I'm sorry, <laughs> it was the life. And we are together with Plataforma Cipó uh, in a joint organization for this event today. Uh, the, the event, as you, as you know, is concentrated on humanitarian operations, gender, vulnerability, and security agencies. Uh, the Interagency Institute is very much dedicated to build bridges. So we are not only researching uh, on interagency and cooperation teams, but we also are, are, are training and doing advocacy in the benefit of the enhancement of cooperation protocols, cooperation schemes, and so on, especially in, in security issues. So today we are very much dedicated to the gender uh, issues, and we concentrate ourselves as in the Venezuela case, uh, the Venezuela refugees case, in, in, which, um, we, in which we have, uh, uh, you know, great, uh, of great importance, uh, humanitarian problems of great importance. We, uh, for, you know, some years, Brazil had established uh, an operation called Acolida, cooperation, the, there is not a good translation to this, but uh, we could use welcoming operation. And they have very good results. Uh, they have been achieving very good results uh, with, this, with this operation, but even uh, with the good results, there are still lots to do and many problems to deal with. So uh, we have not only the military and uh, police operation involve, involvement on the situation, but we also have many uh, civil society organizations. So we're looking to this case as to see what are the gaps, the eventual gaps we can identify when we look into the schemes and frameworks that are in place. But we also are uh, going to, to promote here with your ideas, initiating with the panelists, um, but we are going to offer some ideas as to promote at the, at the end of this day, a kind of wrap up of the good ideas and good, good practices that we can put in a final report and final advocacy document. The, the event is structured in two days. So the first day is, is dedicated to a panel, and then we're going uh, to, to organize group work. So as uh, with this method of working, we can achieve not only the panelists' view on the theme regarding their expertise, but also the, uh, your inputs, the audience inputs on what we are questioning or promoting as ideas. At the second day, which is going to happen at the 5th of May, it's not only a replica, as the organization document says, but it's going to, to initiate with the, with the wrap up of ideas we can offer today. And then we're going to do a simulation. So we're going to simulate the agencies, the most important agencies involved in the operation. And then we're going to uh, offer through this simulation uh, ideas of better practices that can enhance the, the work of the practitioners involved in the operation. So I'm glad to, to pass uh, to pass the voice to Ana Beatriz uh, Duarte. Ana Beatriz Duarte is a research associate researcher at the Interagency Institute. She's going to introduce herself better and then introduce also the panelists. So uh, we're very glad again, be welcome. 
and stay with us to the end of the event. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, thank you to all participants and our panelists for being here today. Good morning to participants and panelists who are in Latin American region or in America's region and good evening to Asia Pacific region. As Sabrina said, I'm part of the uh, research team in the Asian Interagency Institute, but I'm also a journalist and a PhD candidate in contemporary studies in Coimbra University. So I'm going to moderate the session today. Uh, as Sabrina said, we are going to have uh, two different sessions. One is today and the other one is on May 5. We are taking the Acolida operation as a case study, as a starting point, uh, so as to discuss the protocols and best practices uh, in the governance of interagency operations, especially as uh, to protect uh, women and children's rights. So, um, our session today we, we, is going to be around uh, two, two hours and a half long. And first, we are going to listen to our panel of experts who will share with us their experience with, uh, in humanitarian operations. After that, we are going to have a very brief um, uh, time slot for Q&A. Uh, so if you, if you have questions for any of the panelists, please uh, to, do post, do post your, your questions in the chat box. For the ones who are um, uh, watching through our YouTube channel, you can also uh, post your questions there. And after that, so uh, we're going to to the, our 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 group is going to split up into into four breakup rooms, uh, where our moderator, moderators will collect the group's insights um, to answer a question we are going to share with you. And finally, back back back, back from, from the plenary, back to plenary, we we'll, we're going to hear the different insights from the groups, the results and also the panelists' um, uh, commentaries and remarks. So without further ado, let's listen to our group of experts. We are starting, um, I'll, I'll follow the alphabetical order and I'll start then with Dr. Adriana Ertal Abdenour. Uh, Dr. Adriana is the co-founder and executive director of Plataforma CIPO, dedicated to climate, peace building, and sustainable development in Latin America and the Caribbean. Plataforma CIPO, as Sabrina has already mentioned, is a co-host uh, for today's meeting. She's a social scientist with extensive uh, experience of international security, and she has worked on environmental crime in the Amazon and Cerrado regions of South America, as well as in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. She is a member of the UN Committee on Development Policy, as well as of the group of experts that advises the United Nations on climate and security. She earned a PhD from Princeton University, and she was at the Brazil-Venezuela uh, Brazil border and talk to some of the Venezuelan uh, migrant heirs. Adriana, it's very good to see you here. Please, the stage is yours. Uh, good morning or good afternoon uh, from Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much, Ana Beatriz, for introducing me. And thanks to uh, all of our partners at Interagency Institute. This has been a very important I would say more than a, a, a partnership, a friendship between two organizations as they consolidate their work. I'm going to talk um, and try to summarize some of the research that Ana Beatriz has referenced that we've been doing on the border between Brazil and Venezuela, especially in the towns of Pacaraima and Boa Vista, although we are also analyzing the process of um, uh, uh, voluntary resettlements around Brazil uh, in, in different places within the country. And what I'm going to focus on is the impacts of climate change on the reception of refugees specifically, and therefore the need to address um, and to enact climate action through collaboration between different stakeholders. Now, as you probably know, the debates about 
climate and migration, uh, as well as refu refuge, have been intensifying both uh, within the region, but also I think especially at a global level. And we know that climate matters uh, not only because it has become a recognized driver of migratory movements, at least a factor that contributes towards uh, forced displacement. And this, by the way, happens mostly within countries, but it's also very relevant to refugee settings such as the one uh, as the Venezuelan uh, refugee crisis. But in addition to being one of the drivers, climate change um, clearly undermines the capacity of receiving countries and even local communities to welcome and to integrate new arrivals. And when we look at refugees, including the situation we observe on the Brazil-Venezuela border, what we find is that the Venezuelan refugees, especially uh, groups like women and children and indigenous refugees, and if you put all of those together, they comprise the majority of those who are in Pocaraima and um, Boa Vista. They are extremely vulnerable to climate change, not only in their places of origin, but also throughout the migratory process and the, the refuge process. So I'm going to address very briefly two questions. A, what risks does climate change pose in the context of the Venezuelan refugee crisis? And B, what measures can be taken by stakeholders? When, what best practices can we identify, especially those that are relevant for women and indigenous groups as well as children? So first, a little bit of context. There is already some research showing that um, climate change, along with inadequate infrastructure, has contributed to the ref Venezuelan refugee crisis. For instance, droughts and deterioration of energy infrastructure but also extreme weather events and environmental degradation have contributed towards, for instance, the migration of the Warao um, indigenous communities, but also more broadly of Venezuelans to other countries in the region. And in Brazil, we also know that in Horaima, the state in which we carry out the research and where the vast majority of Venezuelans arrive in Brazil is highly susceptible to climate change, especially due to the intensification of heat uh, and drought. And on the other hand, during the rainy season, uh, the increasing unpredictability and intensity of rains. And in addition, Huayma is very susceptible right now to environmental degradation. Even though most of the state is composed of natural savanna, there are parts of it, especially around the Yanomami indigenous lands, which are right on the border, that are heavily forested. And even though Horaima historically has not been among the Brazilian Amazon states with the highest rates of deforestation, what we observe over the past two years is that it now does feature prominently among those with highest rates. Um, and um, it, is the, it was the top state in which forest fires took place um, in uh, last year. So how are cli these climate risks affecting the Re Venezuelan refugees and Operação Acolhida? First of all, flooding periodically affects um, the shelters, which are overcrowded, as well as city parks and other public areas where many of the refugees end up staying. Um, this destroys their possessions, but most importantly, it leaves people, especially uh, children, much more susceptible to disease. And in fact, in 2018, there was a protest organized by the Venezuelan refugees uh, because of the lack of infrastructure to protect them from these very intense rains. At one period, they had 18 consecutive days of very heavy rain. But the flooding also undermines the existing infrastructure. So earlier this month, April 2021, very strong rains flooded the biggest public hospital in Horaima, uh, which is of course already overloaded because of the COVID pandemic. Um, the rain was so heavy that not only did it flood the floor, but it cracked the roof tiles and staff had to scramble in order to move patients around. Um, in addition, there are heat spots uh, detected in Horaima and heat waves that exacerbate the problem of fires uh, in the forested and the savanna regions. Again, this leads to a lot of respiratory problems and other health problems, including among the refugee population. And of course, it destroys vegetation cover and uh, endangers facilities as a whole. So according to satellite data from the National Institute for Space Research, 
just from January to April this year, um, 4,300 fires were detected in Horaima, which was the double of the total for last year. And during this period in Pacaraima alone, where most of the refugees arrived, 156 heat spots were detected. So obviously it's a very, very important issue. But more broadly, we know that climate change threatens food and water security, uh, making means of subsistence even more challenging, not only for a population that has been made even more vulnerable due to the COVID pandemic, but also for the host communities more broadly because the impacts of course are very broad. Uh, as for women, they have um, the, the refugee women, they have a special difficulties in finding jobs. This is one area in which we, we need more work more broadly, but also they tend to have health problems that are specific, gender specific, and that uh, usually are left unaddressed by the, the refugee reception programs or else they don't adequately incorporate a gender perspective. So what can be done and what are the, some of the best practices that we can identify? At the level of norms and frameworks, I think it's important to mention that UNHCR has developed a really interesting strategic approach to climate action based on three different pillars. And all of these are very relevant to the context in Hodaima. Uh, the first one is protection of people who are forcibly displaced to climate change, which requires coordination among all of the different stakeholders, including different national, different levels of governments in Brazil, which has not been taking place. Um, second, the greening of refugee, refugee responses, including reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and negative impacts on the environment. And this um, means that you know, risk assessment has to be carried out of climate risks, but also climate vulnerability in different groups of the refugee and local populations. And this has really to be thought through jointly by the stakeholders, not only for the current situation, but also looking at projections for the future, because sometimes the refuge response tends to be very short-sighted, but we can expect the movement of the migratory movements to continue. Um, and this also means bringing in, for instance, uh, scientists and universities, including local universities that can provide the data, the modeling of the climate projection. Um, in addition, actors should seek to better understand climate dynamics in the place of origin. And we still don't understand very well what's happening in Venezuela, although there is growing evidence. Secondly, mitigation measures are needed, including through more sustainable practices in the refugee reception settings, uh, as well as data collection on greenhouse gas emissions, which of course can be even higher when military operations, such as Operação Acolhida are involved because they tend to be very energy intensive and therefore identifying areas of energy transition within the scope of Operação Acolhida. And finally, we need way more adaptation. So we have seen some good practices in Operação Acolhida. For instance, there have been some infrastructure adaptations. Some decks have been built over the areas in the uh, reception centers that are most vulnerable to flooding. But the last time that we were in the region, we saw with our own eyes that whenever it rains, uh, parts of those uh, reception centers are flooded and people are affected very directly. Some of the tents that were being used at the time, they're not waterproof. And even though some additional covers had been implemented, there's still a lot of work to be done. And of course, neither Pacaraima nor Boa Vista have adequate drainage systems. So there are many things that, for instance, even the, you know, the military can assist because they do have capability in their engineering core. And then finally, we need to think, and this is more a recommendation than the best practices, about how to mainstream a climate perspective across the entire process of uh, voluntary resettlement, which we call inter interiorization within the scope of acolhida a, a operation, because obviously climate change is not limited to just Venezuela and Horema, but rather affects the entire of Brazil. So I'm going to share in the chat a couple of publications that we have put out recently on climate migration, but also the role of women, um, because of course they are very important sources of solutions rather than just uh, disproportionately victimized by these dynamics. 
but I very much look forward to any further ideas and feedback that arise out of the discussion. So thank you again, very much looking forward to the breakout sessions and the rest. Okay, obrigada. Thank you very much, Adriana. Very, uh, very interesting point. Very interesting link with the uh, climate, the, the the climate with the climate perspective. So our next panelist is Dr. Ana Luisa Bravo and Paiva. She is part of the laboratory laboratory of simulations and scenarios at the Brazilian Naval War College. She coordinates a project on simulations and behavior analysis for the benefit of the integ integrated security at the Brazilian Ministry of Defense and the coordination for the improvement of higher education personnel, CAPES. She is also an assistant professor of the Brazilian Army Command and Staff College, where she is a member of the faculty at the accredited military studies graduate program. She has received her PhD in comparative history from Rio de Janeiro Federal University and was a fellow researcher of the George Marshall Center, European Center for Security Studies. She has been to field missions, including the Ecolidia operation in the Brazil and Amazon region. Dr. Ana Luisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Ana Beatriz, uh, for your presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to to thank Professor Sabrina Medeiros for the invitation to be here today. And considering all the goals of this event, I decided to bring some ideas um, basically based on my experience on, on the field when I have visited uh, Pacaraima and uh, Boa Vista, but also uh, all the experience we've got uh, with some studies uh, uh, in migration in Brazil. So a little bit, my, my, my speak today, my speech, it will be a little bit different from Adriana that, will, that has addressed some, some ideas, some best practice. I will uh, talk a little bit about the structure of uh, Operation Acolhida. So uh, I have been studying migrations, especially forced migration throughout my academic career since I was uh, undergraduate student. In that time, Professor Sabrina was my advisor at uh, Federal University. And uh, uh, Operação Acolhida is uh, particularly uh, provocative for me for two, uh, two, three reasons, actually. One uh, is because it's the largest uh, flow of migrants and asylum seekers that demands has demanded the creation of shelters in the recent history here in Brazil. So uh, this is a big, uh, this is the, the first uh, moment in history that uh, Brazilian authorities had to deal with this kind of uh, problem, what they think in the, the, the first perspective, it was a problem, but uh, as long they were uh, uh, debating, they recognized they had to solve what they considered uh, a problem. Uh, two, uh, Operação Acolhida has provided uh, to be a unique opportunity to test the new Brazilian migration law of 2017. Uh, it is, uh, just to, to put some context on this, the Brazilian new migration law, uh, immigration law has uh, been approved recently and uh, Operação Acolhida has been launched, launched on 2018, one year after. And the new, uh, the new legislation has, uh, is known for uh, here in Brazil and also internationally as a, a humanitarian migration policy. And uh, third, uh, and in this point, I have a particular uh, interest uh, because nowadays my research agenda is integrating some aspects of uh, interagency cooperation. Uh, the, when we think about uh, Operação Acolhida, uh, we have to think that we are talking about a, a remote area. Now we are talking about Amazon, uh, Amazonian state, which has some difficulties in logistical terms, not only to integrate the rest of the country, but also 
in terms of materials to be uh, transported to that area. So due to that, uh, con and considering also the complexity of receiving uh, migrants in the border, uh, throughout the border, we have to, to consider that this operation is complex. So to maintain it, uh, uh, we, we, it requires a, interracial cooperation, a strong interracial cooperation, especially on civil military co coordination. And then I, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this civil military relation. Uh, just, to you, just to illustrate, uh, there is over 90 agencies, uh, over than 90 agencies involved in this operation. That, in that we include uh, governmental uh, organizations, uh, which include civilian and militaries, international agencies, NGOs, and private companies. So it's a, that's, that's the reason this, uh, this operation is being very challenging to, to the agents, not only to the agents, but to the, the, all the government. Well, uh, so in terms of governance and structure, the Operação Acolhida is, uh, is, is, is a responsibility of interministerial committee, which is uh, coordinated by the Casa Civil, which is uh, the, the articulation, the main articulation uh, scheme of the government. And the, the, logis the logistical issues are responsible, uh, uh, are the responsibility of the Ministry of Defense. So the army, the Brazilian army, uh, due to his uh, presence in Amazonia, became uh, the, coordinating, the coordinator of the Humanitarian Logistic Task Force. This operation has three pillars. So some of them Professor Adriana has already talked about. One of the pillars uh, is the boarding planner, planning. So in the city of Pacaraima, which is in the border of Brazil and uh, Venezuela, uh, the migrants that cross the, the border to Brazil has the legal and the medical assistance and they are identified. So there is a security uh, interest, but not only that, uh, some, uh, some of the, the migrants, actually all of the migrants are identified. They get the, the documents to get in Brazil and they also uh, have uh, 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 they also take vaccines to to get in the the country. Uh, the second pillar is the how uh, is the the housing and the shelters. Uh, nowadays we have uh, three uh, thirteen uh, shelters in total. Uh, some of them, most of them are in Boa Vista, which is the capital of the state of Roraima, and some of them are in Manaus, which is the, the capital of the Amazonian, Amazonas state, which is close, but not so close. It's six hours driving from one city to other. So this is very common in Brazil because we are talking about a, a continental country. So, uh, but uh, it's the, the considering the, the, the area, uh, Manaus is the closest capital uh, to Boa Vista and is the only one who, who could uh, help uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure. Well, um, let me see uh, what else I can talk about the, the housing and the shelters. So one of the interesting things uh, related to, to the shelters uh, is that the, the shelters follow follow the UNHCR norms, all of them. Uh, the, the shelters, the migrants uh, are separated by gender, families and ethnicity. So uh, Professor Adriana has talked about also about the indigenous people, the Warao. And it's interesting because the Warao has a specific uh, shelter uh, because uh, we con uh, they consider 
that cultural differences that imply social relations and the food relations are really important for them. That's the reason they decided to separate the, the indigenous from the other Venezuelans. Uh, and the third pillar of the, the, the operation, Acolhida Operação Acolhida, is the interiorization. Uh, in partnership with other uh, states, uh, the government are trying to, to, inter, uh, to interiorize the, the migrants uh, for develop the socioeconomic inclusion. Why that is important? Because Roraima is a, a state, it's, it's a kind of, it's not small in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of ge geographically talking, but uh, we, don't, we don't have much, uh, many jobs, uh, opportunities there. So that's the reason it's important to bring the, bring the, the migrants and the refugees and asylum seekers to the other, uh, the other parts of the country. Well, uh, when I was there, uh, one of the, the things that was a kind of impressive was uh, the capability of the armed, armed force, especially the, the, the army to, to uh, develop and build in a, in a fast way the, the shelters. Uh, less than one in less than one year, they could build uh, around the ten shelters. Uh, and when we are talking about logistical problems, we are talking uh, about the materials. Uh, uh, in that region, it's difficult even to to find the basic materials for construction. So uh, that's the reason the military, the use of the armed forces was very important in these humanitarian operations. Uh, so uh, uh, we have in the structure, uh, trying to coordinate all these agencies, there is a, a, a weekly meeting, which is coordinated by the, the military, by the, the army, and uh, they try to, integrate and coordinate all the issues, uh, considering all these three pillars uh, that I have ma had mentioned. But uh, uh, when I was there doing my interview, because one of the issues I wanted to, to assess was uh, the level of coordinator, uh, the coordination and also the integration of these agencies was the difficult that uh, uh, we can see in this in these meetings and in the touch of the these agencies related to the organ uh, organization uh, organizational culture. So uh, uh, when we are talking about mil civil military relations on the on the ground, it's a kind of difficult, especially in the Brazilian case, uh, because uh, Brazilian military doctrine. Uh, has uh, relatively recent integrated the, the aspects of uh, uh, interagency operations. So this is something very new in, in our military doctrine. Uh, the military and the civil agency started to, to uh, work together more, uh, more more since the Olympic Games, so it's it, it was uh, about 2016. Uh, another thing that I, I could ad address as a challenge uh, we could see in our uh, in our operation is the lack of experience in Brazil in managing immigration flows, uh, especially uh, on of these types. Uh, of humanitarian nature. Brazil has uh, par part participated uh, since 2004 of uh, humanitarian operations like peacekeeping, uh, but uh, th this is the first time we are planning and coordinating all the, all of the, the steps 
of a humanitarian uh, operation in our country, in our territory. So uh, that's the reason there are so much many things that are still in progress. So considering all I've said here, uh, it's possible to say we have uh, many uh, many progress, considering this is a, a very important operation, but uh, we still have some limitations. So I would like to thank you the opportunity for today, and I'll be open to some questions in the, the final moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your, such an experience with us, Ana, Ana, Lucia, Ana Luisa. I'm sorry, let's move on to our third panelist then. Uh, Dana Brown Romero is a senior gender advisor in Honduras, I, uh, IAS, IASC Gender Standby Capacity Project, GenCap. She has been a member of GenCap since tw uh, 2020 and has over 14 years experience in international humanitarian and, and development work as a senior gender and GBV advisor in Latin America and the Caribbean and South Sudan. She has experience working with governments, international NGOs such as Diaconia and UN agencies like UNDP, UNFPA, UNHCR and UN, UN Women. As part of gender specialists of UN Women, she coordinated and provided technical support to the support round ta table of gender in humanitarian actions in Red Lock, which was activated in the COVID-19 context in order to provide technical support in integrating gender approach in humanitarian response in the region. Likewise, Dana served as a regional gender focal point and supported the coordination of support spaces, working group, and the trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants subsector of the Regional Coordination Platform for Refugees and Migrants from Venezuela, the R4V. So let's hear from you, Dana Romero, please. Thank you, Jess. I'm not able to share my screen. Maybe you could please um, help me to, to share my presentation. Oh, just a moment, let me... Um... Well, thank you for while we have um, my presentation on the screen. Um, as uh, Anna Matriz mentioned, I, I would like to first say thank you for inviting Jane to be part of this uh, webinar. And also uh, for inviting me to share some ideas from my regional experience in my previous uh, positions in the in LAC region. Uh, what I would like to share uh, first is related to the uh, situation of uh, refugee and migrant uh, women and girls in the region, uh, the women and girls from Venezuela in the region, also share some uh, useful tools from the global framework related to gender uh, and humanitarian action, gender and migration and uh, its uh, relationship uh, with the peace, women, peace and security uh, framework. And um, third, uh, share some recommendations from my uh, experience and this uh, global uh, framework related to uh, the non-migration. Um, okay, yes. Dana, just a moment, Do you, would you like to, oh, okay, you can, oh, now, now we can see your screen. Mm -hmm. and Ah, great. So what we just do what I was mentioned, this is my, what we have, I just would like to mention some critical issues uh, related with uh, the situation of, of women, migrant and refugee uh, women and girls from Venezuela. What we have, it's a critical context um, with two, um, um, migration uh, crisis in uh, Venezuela, but also uh, in Central America. Also, the Latin American region has uh, faced um, 
the increase of uh, criminality, gun uh, violence, uh, narco trafficking, trafficking in persons also affecting most um, women and girls, and also increased level of uh, inequality and discrimination. Uh, women and girls from Venezuela uh, have been facing all so um, gender-based violence, uh, feminicide in several countries. Uh, um, in addition to a conflict uh, situation in countries uh, like Colombia, for example, and also the insecurity and displacement, which has um, been uh, exacerbating in the in this uh, a region because of climate change, as was mentioned in one of the previous presentations, also by uh, disasters, for example, in the Central American region, but also related to a conflict, uh, not only armed conflict, uh, I'm also talking about um, social and political conflict in, in several countries um, in, in South America. Well, what we know about the uh, uh, we don't have a regional gender analysis about the situation of migrant, refugee, and uh, asylum seeker uh, women and girls. What we have is some uh, gender analysis uh, developed by uh, some international national organizations about their situation. But what we have now is that most uh, um, refugee and migrants from Venezuela uh, are located in the Latin American uh, region. Uh, most, for example, in Colombia. Colombia has uh, 1 million and uh, 700,000 uh, people from um, Venezuela. Also, it includes uh, returnees. <laughs> hmm. Which uh, are um, Colombian uh, living in Venezuela who uh, should uh, migrate uh, due to a, a critical uh, situation in, in Venezuela. What we know is that 49% uh, um, are uh, women and 48% uh, are uh, young people. And women and girls uh, have been facing limited access to decent work. Uh, it means uh, low paid jobs, um, lack of uh, social protection, also limited access to food, to health uh, services, um, and also uh, limited access uh, to education, um, in particular due to uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, measures, girls and uh, adolescents and young uh, women have been facing these uh, barriers to access to education. Also, they have been facing protection risks. Um, such as exploitation and abuse, uh, uh, sexual and gender based violence and trafficking. Um, also, uh, um, if you look at the um, numbers related to uh, irregular migration of uh, uh, women and girls uh, from Venezuela, this is a key uh, a fact which uh, increase their uh, exposition to uh, protection risks. And also they have been facing discrimination, xenophobia, or restrictive uh, gender migration policies in several countries, uh, countries uh, before uh, the COVID pandemic um, started, but also increased in this, with this uh, new context. And also they have been facing um, several barriers in terms of access to um, to uh, uh, formal remittances, but also to access to finance uh, services. Um, I just would like to remind and mention some of the uh, key tools from the uh, global framework in terms of gender equality and human in action with this link to uh, peace and security and uh, development, uh, some development measures, what we have. And uh, this is an, this, all of these are important tools when we talk about how the response should be provided in shelters, how the uh, military and security forces should provide um, a response in orders, for example. Uh, well, what we have is the four humanitarian principles and uh, the central protection principles, which include 
include some um, important, important to gender based violence. But I would like to mention what the Sendai framework, which applies to uh, in disasters uh, context. Uh, and the uh, CEDAW, CEDAW um, a convention, which includes uh, some specific measures to be um, uh, taken into account when we are talking of uh, humanitarian and the uh, disaster uh, context. And also, uh, um, I, I see a policy and accountability framework on gender equality and women uh, and empowerment of women and girls in Hutchinan action. What we see here is the gender handbook, uh, which is a uh, very practical tool, uh, which particular measures to be uh, taken uh, into account for humanitarian actors and, um, uh, for example, how to evaluate gender analysis to identify humanitarian needs, how to include uh, um, gender Gender responsive uh, programming in as part of the humanitarian response, and in particular, on particular measures uh, in terms of shelter uh, by each uh, humanitarian sector, uh, such as shelter, um, uh, water, um, uh, uh, sanitation and hygiene, uh, protection, uh, food security, health, including uh, sexual and reproductive health, among other uh, uh, other uh, humanitarian sectors. And at all the work to remind some uh, key tools, uh, just to uh, mention the new uh, the New York uh, Declaration, which is a framework to a new uh, global compact related one uh, related to refugees and the other one related to migration, and uh, some uh, general recommendations from the CEDAW committee related to migrant workers, women, peace and security, refugee, asylum seekers, and uh, stateless stateless um, by women, also to GBB uh, general recommendations, which applies also in humanitarian uh, uh, context. And the last one related to trafficking and women and girls in the context of uh, global migration. This last uh, recommendation has certain measures which should be uh, developed by governments, also by uh, civil society, and, uh, including um, humanitarian actors in terms of how to prevent and respond to uh, trafficking um, in women and girls. What we have in the region is a uh, national and international migration governance, uh, a gender blind uh, migration governance um, with uh, low uh, capacity to address and respond to a particular um, uh, needs uh, of uh, women and girls. Even if all of these uh, um, uh, instruments uh, promote gender equality and women's empowerment. In our region, we have faced some uh, um, difficulties to, to put in place all of these um, uh, instruments. And also what we have here is the, 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 the Women, Peace and Security Framework. What I'd like to mention um, uh, related to this framework is one of the importance of uh, um, the participation of women in, as part of the prevention of conflict, but also as part of the initiatives in terms of uh, mediation or um, negotiation of uh, conflict in our region. Also, the importance of uh, increasing the number and uh, the number of women in the security sector is also important to increase their, their participation in this particular uh, sector and also to uh, develop measures to uh, prevent and respond to uh, um, conflict-related uh, sexual violence and improve uh, the women's participation in all of these um, measures. And just to, to, to finish, I would like to, uh, to mention some uh, recommendations from uh, my experience in my in my uh, in my previous position uh, as part of the uh, R4B uh, platform, but also working with the UN Women uh, Country offices and uh, several uh, humanitarian actors, I have identified the importance of uh, supporting a women-led organization and and develop gender-responsive uh, 
socioeconomic uh, integration initiatives. You and women in IOM have been uh, developing uh, interesting um, projects in Colombia, Brazil, uh, and also equal uh, to address uh, specific uh, women's needs and to promote uh, their uh, economic uh, integration. Also to recognize that uh, refugee and migrant women's independence, autonomy, agency, leadership are not, they are not only a victims of violence, of, of victims of this crisis, they are also uh, um, agents of uh, change. Also it's important to, um, to transform policies laws, programs, and also services. Uh, and as uh, in a gender responsive way, they uh, should address, recognize, and promote gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. And taking into account the particular um, discrimination that uh, women and girls from Venezuela are facing in, in our region. Also to Uh, enable migrant uh, women's uh, full economic and social participation participation in several levels and address, as I was mentioned, the multiple and intersecting uh, forms of discrimination that they are facing in, in our region. Um, also include uh, specific measures to uh, facilitate their access to uh, physical and mental health services. Uh, for example, uh, women pregnant and, and they are facing, uh, they are still facing barriers to access to uh, health uh, services, uh, including sexual and reproductive uh, health, to education, to uh, vocational training, to decent work. They are uh, in Colombia, um, 25 of every uh, 100, um, occupied uh, workers from Venezuela are uh, women, uh, and most of them are working in the informal uh, sector. So this is a, also a very important um, measure to be, to be implemented. And also to enable the migrant women and girls uh, to, to live their lives in dignity and safety, uh, and also to develop um, um, uh, comprehensive, comprehensive uh, measures to address, to respond to uh, to uh, uh, sexual and gender-based violence that they have been uh, facing in our region. In Colombia, we have a, a new uh, um, a temporary protection institute, which uh, includes uh, particular, and this is the, the first to be uh, launched and implemented in our region. This is a particular uh, a legal instrument to protect and to promote uh, employment and security um, measures uh, to address um, the um, refugee and migrant uh, um, from Venezuela. So I think it is, this is also a good opportunity to, to implement this kind of um, uh, laws in several uh, countries in our region. Our region. So thank you. This is my, my last comment. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share these ideas. And I am I'm also uh, open to, to um, continue participating in this work. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you very much, Donna. Very interesting set of recommendations there. So our uh, last uh, speaker um, is Dr. Pichamon Yepatong. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. So Dr. Pichamon is an Australian Research Council Fellow and Senior Lecturer in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of New South Wales, Canberra, at the Australian Defence Force Academy. She also convenes UNA, UNSW Canberra's Asia-Pacific Development and Security Research Group. A political scientist by training, Dr. Yapatong has uh, conducted research into cultures of humanitarianism, 
and the evolution of humanitarian action, especially in the Asia Pacific context. She has also consulted with a range of international and local NGOs and think tanks on human rights and security challenges. And in 2020, she was recogni uh, recognized as a human rights fighter and a finalist by the Advance Awards. Prior to joining UNSW, Pichamon Yapatong was a global leader fellow at the University of Oxford and Princeton University. So let's turn the floor over to you, Dr. Pichamon Yapatong, please. You're going to share a screen, right? You. Yes, I will. You have you have the rights already. Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before I do start sharing my screen, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Anna Beatrice, and of course, thank you, Sabrina, for the very kind in, um, invitation to participate in this event. Um, I have to say I've had the great pleasure of working alongside Sabrina and Anna Luisa as well, um, and hearing more about um, the welcoming operation. Um, today, what I will be speaking about are the principles um, for gender sensitivity in humanitarian aid operations. And here I will be drawing on a case from the Asia Pacific, which I think could act as an interesting counterpoint um, to Operation Akalida um, and the lessons that can be learned. Um, so here I'll be focusing in particular on the ongoing Rohingya refugee crisis um, in Myanmar and in Bangladesh. So let's share a screen. Hopefully you can see my screen. All right. Um, so uh, to begin, I think after having heard all of those very empirically rich and conceptually nuanced presentations, it, I don't really need to go into the question of why gender sensitivity matters to humanitarian aid operations. Um, obviously, women are disproportionately affected by emergencies. Um, they also face imminent threats uh, to their well-being, to their livelihoods, um, to their families. Um, at the same time, women are also central to the peace um, that we find in households as well as in the community. And as a result, they are integral to any peace building and peacekeeping processes. Um, and this goes back to what the last speaker was saying in terms of women are victims or they can be victims, but they are also agents of change. And it's for this reason that gender sensitivity needs to be um, cognizant of the dual roles um, or the multiple roles really that women can play. In order to of course understand the threats um, and the risks that women face, especially in emergency contexts, it's really important of course to understand the common forms of exclusion that women have to face um, before, during and after a humanitarian emergency. Um, obviously, especially in um, the Asia Pacific, a women face inequality, they face discrimination. Um, there's also a lack of representation of women in key decision-making bodies. Um, as I mentioned previously, women also face differentiated risks, burdens and impacts um, in their everyday lives, but certainly in humanitarian emergencies. Um, in my other work, uh, we've detailed, for instance, how women face uh, triple burdens, when it comes to having looking after the household, having to look after the communities, um, but also having to uh, seek leadership um, and try to lead in times of crises. Um, and at the same time, women also face unequal benefit sharing. When we see um, results, it often tends to be the case that men may be the ones that are the kind of the prime beneficiaries um, and that the impacts on women are often less understudied. And we've seen this in the case of um, Cox's Bazaar um, in the humanitarian camps there, uh, where women are often, even though um, we see a lot of attempts at gender mainstreaming, um, it's still the case that women have not really been able to um, benefit as much from, um, from the services offered in, in these camps. And so at the same time, it's important for us to also understand um, what the causes of exclusion are and what the key barriers to inclusion are. Um, and this is 
in order to better understand what are some of the kind of key principles and enablers of inclusion. So if you look at, to go back to this previous question, um, to use the example of the ongoing Rohingya refugee crisis, um, it's clear that women again face multiple forms of exclusion and barriers to inclusion. Um, even though women and girls account for just over 50% of the population in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, um, and despite the fact that one in six families is headed by a single mother, um, it remains the case that women's voices are not yet uh, well studied or well represented um, when it comes to finding solutions to ongoing um, welfare uh, issues in these camps. At the same time, there are still social and cultural norms um, to tackle as well, especially given that in countries like Bangladesh, um, there are social norms that prevent women, for example, from getting abortions. Um, at the same time, there's limited education on uh, sexual and reproductive health um, and women's rights in this space. Um, this, of course, exacerbated um, by the lack of women's liter literacy um, relative to men. All of this, of course, means that women and girls um, are have to disproportionately face um, the kind of uh, gender-based violence, but also um, sexual exploitation and abuse. And we've heard already reports of how human smugglers have targeted um, refugee camps in Cox's Bazaar um, and how women, girls, um, children uh, are especially targeted um, when it comes to sexual exploitation and abuse um, and uh, trafficking even. Um, which basically means again that they are um, they have the greatest need, one could argue, when it comes to education, awareness raising um, in this space. And yet what we've also seen um, as a result of COVID-19 are the temporary um, closure of, or suspension of safe space services in Cox's Bazaar as a result of the social distancing requirements, um, but also the shortage of humanitarian aid workers as a result of COVID-19. Um, and all of this, again, has contributed to um, the kind of the multiple layers of the refugee crisis that we see um, in Cox's Bazaar at the moment. So to go back to um, the question of what are some of the key principles and en enablers of inclusion that need to be um, streamlined or mainstreamed in humanitarian responses, obviously, if you look at um, GenCap and uh, the documents that have been produced um, from that, do no harm uh, features very prominently, of course, as one of the key principles, key operating principles in order to ensure that women and children um, are, are the, that the uh, disproportionate risks that they face are mitigated. Um, but of course, the challenge here often is one of translating do no harm into actual practice um, and also translating it to suit the local context. Um, what do no harm means in one context it should be universal, but it does get translated or interpreted differently by different stakeholders, different agencies, um, different country contexts. At the same time, it's important to recognize um, individual and context specific factors that may impact how women and children are treated in crisis situations. And this really goes back to the point of intersectionality. Um, acknowledging the fact that women from different ethnic backgrounds, socio-cultural backgrounds um, may, of course, have different experiences and face different sets of risks um, and responsibilities at the same time to consider what uh, the very first speaker was, was speaking about in terms of the climate and um, climate change impacts. It's also important to note, of course, that women um, depending on the geographical area that they inhabit, may also face unique um, challenges in that regard. So as a result, it is very important to consider um, inter intersectionality implications um, for women and children when addressing or designing um, humanitarian responses. At the same time, it's also important to note that um, it's, uh, it's 
that we can't take any anything for granted. Um, and that means that we cannot assume that in every country, in every context, in every camp, um, the rights of women, the rights of children will be respected or will even be acknowledged um, as rights. Um, and this is really the case in, in patriarchal societies, many of which we see in the Asia Pacific region, where women's rights may not be something that it is immediately um, apparent to those um, in power or those uh, in a more dominant position. Um, and what I've seen through my own research, but also through other research, um, is the fact that going into a country or into a particular location and expecting to initiate cultural norms change or transformation immediately is never feasible. Um, instead, it's in order to adopt that kind of uh, gender transformative approach, it's really important that there is a gradual process in place that um, these norms, that we're not trying to change these norms in a day, but instead we're trying to engage um, local understanding to gradually change local expectations in order to then initiate those shifts. And this goes to the kind of the preceding point about finding and identifying champions. Um, of course, it's important to identify women champions in order to sh champion the cause of women and children. But at the same time, it's also important to help men redefine um, their masculinities um, in, order, in, order, in order for men themselves to recognize the role that they play um, in empowering women, women, but also in preventing um, risks um, and so forth to women as well. Um, and this is something, again, in interviews with men has always come out as an important point um, because in certain, in some uh, well-meaning attempts at uh, women's empowerment, um, it may well mean the case that men feel like they are sidelined. And regardless of whether or not that is true, um, it is important that men remain engaged within these processes. And so the point of these operating principles, and I'm not in no way being exhaustive here, um, is really to establish local and collective identities, um, identities that uh, highlight the importance of women to, to peace building, to peace, um, but also to create a local ownership of the solutions as well. Um, so, to, so to ensure that humanitarian aid, humanitarian solutions um, actually speak to the needs of women and ensure that women are the central beneficiaries um, of these um, initiatives and solutions as well. And all of this, of course, is meant to safeguard human rights and well-being, um, which again, I think it's, of course, obviously a very lofty goal, um, but one that needs to be broken down, um, to be unpacked in order to better understand the gender dimensions um, of what it actually means to safeguard human rights and well-being um, in crisis or emergency situations. Um, and so following from that, I've identified some, what I find to be enabling factors or conditions that can help um, kind of empower women, but also to ensure um, in terms of processes that their rights and importance are re recognized. Um, I won't go through all of them in the interest of time, but I would certainly be happy to speak to them further during the Q&A. One of the points that I really wanted to highlight, however, is the one about knowledge creation. And I think it's an infinitely um, important to acknowledge how even though we tend to talk about women, talk about their centrality um, to humani humanitarian operations or peacekeeping, peacebuilding um, processes, it's not too often that we see women, especially local women, really being part of the knowledge creation process. Um, what this means is not just, it's not just about local um, engagement, but it's actually about constant participation on the part of these actors. Um, to actually see them input into how you know the policy reports that we read are are written um, and published, um, but also to see them engage not just through workshops or training sessions um, or interviews, but actually integrated into that process of data collection, fact finding, and and knowledge um, production as a result. And this, I think, is is very much linked to all of the other principles or sorry, all of the other factors that I've listed here. That's central to accountability and transparency. It's also central to the reflexivity and context sensitivity of humanitarian aid workers and interveners as well. 
right? And in order to be an um, culturally, socially gender sensitive organization, that organization really needs to constantly question whether the objectives or the targets that have been set are actually representative and reflective of the needs of women, children, and other mar marginalized and vulnerable groups within that society within which they are working in. Um, and so here I've I thought I'd also uh, kind of leave you with some points to consider. Um, hopefully there'll be a bit of time for us to discuss this further during the Q&A. But I wanted to just again, um, make the point that humanitarian responses can't be seen as just an outcome. Like it can't be outcomes driven. It needs to be process driven. It's about the quality of the process. It's about the gender sensitivity that we see during the process as much as it is about the outcomes. Um, Humanitarian action should not also be about just box ticking, about meeting certain gender analysis goals or um, ensuring that certain tools are implemented, um, but it's really about the quality of the implementation. Um, and so it's for that reason that I've also written down that it shouldn't just be about collecting dis gender disaggregated data, but actually making sense of the data um, and ensuring that there is a constant feedback loop um, between the local women that are most affected and the humanitarian aid and agency involved. And so following from that, um, it's also important that we understand exclusion and in inclusion as really two sides of the same coin. And so in order to un understand how exclusion happens within a certain um, refugee crisis or in a certain location, we also need to understand the flip side. Um, and here, I think it's really important. We, we know what is often wrong when it comes to um, the kind of the exploitation of women or the discrimination that women face. And here will be, I think it's important that we also develop the good practice cases um, of when gender sensitivity is actually seen and where gender analysis has actually worked um, to help make humanitarian operations um, more effective and more um, nuanced. Um, in terms of their engagement with women, uh, as well as with other marginalized and vulnerable groups. Um, so I'm going to end here, uh, but I would welcome any questions and I would be happy to elaborate more on the points that I've just made. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Pichamon. It's very interesting to see uh, how women face not so different uh, uh, problems, even in very different contexts. Uh, we are going now to uh, uh, to have a, Q and a very brief Q and A sessions uh, um, before uh, we go to our breakout rooms. Um, I'd like to um, to uh, address some questions the audience has. Um, made in the chat box and after we come back uh, from the groups to plenary uh, the panelists will have the chance again to uh, to wrap up their uh, their considerations including the results uh, that our moderators are going to bring so um, the first one here is um, uh, addressed to Dr. to Adriana Abdenour, and it comes from John Mark. Um, um, he asks, "Can you expand more on the role of women in addressing the climate risks?" So I'll just uh, ask you to to be brief in the answer, not taking more than uh, well a couple of minutes each. Thank you, Adriana. Okay. Sure. Uh, so thank you, Anna Beatriz, and thank you, John Mark, for the question. I think this is a really important area, and it's actually a gap. We need um, knowledge generation, uh, as Pishamon uh, put it, on many things, and this is, I think, one of the, the main gaps. We do know, and I shared a publication by Sipo in the chat, that broadly speaking, so outside of the humanitarian refugee crisis, women in the Amazon have a very important and even leading role to play in climate action. Um, even as they, for instance, have less uh, access to land tenure uh, or you know, they do suffer disproportionately in other ways, women are very much collect connected to the land, uh, often because within traditional communities, their tasks are related to 
cultivation and to preservation of that particular environment. And we also know, for instance, that indigenous women in the Amazon have constituted networks, and some of these span different countries, to exchange ideas. And they range um, from you know, climate adaptation through seed collection and storage to you know, how to mobilize more broadly in order to call attention to the need for mitigation and adaptation. I don't think that incipient knowledge has been mobilized very much within the context of the refugee crisis. And so I think one of the first steps would be to carry out a survey of the refugee women, uh, including indigenous ones, to uh, see how they tend to respond and what their ideas are for mit both mitigation and adaptation. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, next one, um, next one is to to Ana Lucia. She she already answered in the chat box, but I would like you to 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 share your answer with uh, everybody in the audience, if you if you can, please. The question is how are gen uh, how are gender separated while also dealing with families which are naturally multi gender. And also uh, the number of Venezuela mi migrants registered uh, in, in Brazil. So if you could um, uh, address the audience, please, Ana Luisa. Sure, thank you for the questions. Well, uh, the uh, answering the first question, we have uh, 13, as I said, uh, shelters uh, in the, uh, held by the, the acolhida by the operation. In this, uh, in uh, in this, we have multi uh, multi gender. When we are talking about family, they are multi gender. So uh, it can be the mother, the father, and the and the ch children, uh, or also the mother and the children, which is the the majority of the composition of the families in their in their shelters. But also we have some other shelters made by the civil society and held by NGOs. They are uh, mostly addressed for uh, women and their children. So we have these two, two compositions. And uh, the other questions related about the data, right? The number of, uh, let me check, I, I guess I have it here in, in the chat. How high is the number of Venezuelan migrants registered currently in Brazil? Well, um, Brazil uh, is much more a transit country. I guess Dana has presented uh, a, a map showing that uh, the number is not so expressive, but uh, Brazil, due to uh, the facilities of uh, entrance, uh, 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 is being used by the migrants as a transit country. So men come to Brazil and they and then they go to other countries like, uh, uh, for example, Argentina, Uruguay, other countries in in South America. But uh, I I've uh, I've posted here some data. So for example, uh, here uh, we had two possibilities considering the new law. Uh, the new migration law. The, the Venezuelan can apply for uh, asylum seeker, as asylum seeker for refugee, uh, or they can apply for temporary migrants, human, like, because now we have a kind of humanitarian visa. So uh, now we have more than uh, uh, 265,000 Venezuelan migrants that uh, requested the migratory regularization. And also I have other uh, information here, for example, uh, 890,000 assistance carry out at the bo border. It doesn't mean this, this migrant will be here in Brazil. Maybe they can pass and they are using the country uh, only as a, a, a transit destination. Thank you very much, Ana Luisa, for clarifying. Um, Dana Romero, uh, um, 
let me find you here in my screen. <laughs> um, uh, I, I uh, felt I have some trouble listening sometimes to your presentation. I don't know if it was just with me, but I had some um, connection issues here. So, uh, but th there is one thing I'd like you to to go 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 deep on, if you can. That I thought it was very interesting when you said that women are not only victims; they are agents and should be um, dealt with like that. Could you uh, comment a little bit further on that? Yeah, sorry for my. Uh, internet connection. Uh, well, this is a, a key um, idea from the Global Compact of Migration and also from uh, several international um, in, uh, uh, conventions and it's to, to recognize that uh, women, uh, refugees and, and migrants have been uh, facing uh, gender-based violence uh, within the armed conflicts, but also within their families and also on the streets, uh, on, uh, in the borders. And that's a very important issue to be addressed by governments. But on the other hand, it's important to, to go, go forward and uh, look at and recognize um, uh, uh, women and girls, refugees and migrants as an opportunity to uh, uh, host uh, countries and host uh, communities. They are also uh, sharing their experiences, knowledge uh, in favor of uh, their communities. They are, uh, for example, supporting in, in this pandemic um, and uh, providing health um, care services, also providing their expertise from their uh, professional um, careers. They are also providing support in, in several um, areas. So it's important to recognize that, um, that, uh, that support and also in particular recognize that women uh, 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 they are. Um, they have uh, rights. They have uh, autonomy. They have independence. They have the uh, possibility to contribute to uh, society and also to the uh, development of uh, in their host uh, countries. Thank you. Okay. That's very interesting. Thank you very. Uh, thank you very much, Donna. And uh, finally, last one, Pechamoni uh, you, Apatong. You, it was very interesting, um, a very interesting point you mentioned was about knowledge creation, the, collect, the, the, data, collect, the, the data collecting as um, a, a first step to, 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 to many other uh, measures. Um, after that, to like uh, uh, giving voice, accountability, transparency. Um, also, uh, we had some um, commentaries uh, from the public about the inclusion of a man uh, that is engaging man with this decision. So could, uh, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Um, thank you for that, Ana Beatriz. And I think the point really is that when you look at some of the policy documents that you know governments sign up to or or that are created at the international level, understandably many of them are intended more at the strategic level, at the systems level. But the reality is, I think when it comes to coordination on the on the ground, when it comes to um, mobilizing participation, especially amongst women and those uh, and other marginalized or vulnerable groups. Um, what we really need is not a closed feedback loop where you have, you know, a mechanism where women feed into if they want to report sexual harassment or sexual abuse or other forms of 
um, exploitation or gender-based violence, but there needs to be a, a constant interaction. And I understand that there are operational constraints, of course, within um, refugee camps or in humanitarian crisis situations. But at the same time, it is important that there is a mechanism in place that allows for women to feed back to feed their experiences back into um, the humanitarian response on an almost daily basis. Um, and only then will we, I think, will we start to see how women are impacted, what kind of risks they face, but also kind of take into consideration the invisible impacts that, you know, a humanitarian crisis might have on a woman as well. And the unintended consequences of certain humanitarian solutions or responses that are leveraged. Um, and I think it's looking at across other development um, spaces and not necessarily only in humanitarian contexts, but also in kind of, you know, everyday contexts. It's clear that there are certain things that we take for granted, um, perhaps, you know, how for example, how women and men use power, electricity is very different. And so in a humanitarian or refugee camp, um, it may well mean that, you know, power, power struggles are literal and that women and men might have to um, fight over who gets to use the little power or electricity that exists um, and what that's used for, whether it's used for cooking or used for watching TV, for instance, or, or for something else. And the same goes for when it comes to, to water, health and sanitation issues, right? We all know, of course, that women um, and children require much safer spaces when it comes to latrines and, um, you know, and fences and, and all that. So it's those kind of those little things that really make a bigger difference um, to the security and well-being of women and other marginalized and, and vulnerable groups. Um, so that and and my my that's really my point around knowledge creation. I think we need to see local women and women um, much like many of the women attending this event, to really be part of that process of creating the knowledge, um, fact checking the data that's collected um, and feeding into these processes at this much higher, um, whether it be at the international, regional or national levels. Um, and it's, it's not just about representation, but it is also about accuracy um, and, and again, um, ensuring that these realities um, everyday realities that women face are are represented um, in these documents um, and in these types of events as well. Um, the other point about men really is that I think sometimes when we want to, when we think about gender sensitivity, of course, we focus on women, we focus on, on children, on LGBTQI um, groups and so forth. Um, but at the same time, of course, there's emerging studies now about how men also face sexual violence. Um, and how this remains a very understudied issue, um, especially in, in war, um, in conflict uh, affected um, situations. And so there is a uh, more need for greater understanding, I think, uh, to see how men can also be victims of gender based violence. Um, and exploitation as well as abuse. But at the same time, going back to the point really about champions, it's again, a point that's been made by a variety of organizations at both the international, regional, national levels. Um, and it's just really important to identify men as champions alongside women um, and to, to encourage them to rethink um, existing kind of socio-cultural norms, because as I said earlier, you can't change a social or cultural norm in a day, um, but you need buy-in from, you know, the majority, right? And, and if we want to change a patriarchal society, we need to start from the men as much as we need to start from the women. Um, and so that's really the simple point, I'm, the simple yet difficult to achieve point I'm, I'm trying to make, is that we cannot underestimate the importance of of um, positioning men as champions um, alongside women. And to, as one of the commenters made the point, like the, to establish them um, as gatekeepers of culture and to also um, inaugurate them as agents of, of meaningful normative change. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you so much for clarifying for for going further on that and uh, that's that's really interesting that reminded me of the um, words of the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator Mark Lokov during the opening of this conference week 
uh, which is on inclusion, by the way. So he said, um, if there is one thing that will make the system better, it will be that we listen harder to what people in crisis say they want and we give them more uh, of the things they ask for. This is what inclusion is about. So that, that, is, that sounded me. Uh, so with that, uh, we move on to our second part after watching this um, very uh, uh, insightful panel of experts. So we invite you all to join, in, to join the breakout rooms to address uh, the question that guides our, our section here, our discussion, which is what actions or practices should be adopted to improve the coordination of multi-agency humanitarian operations with regard to protecting migrant women and children. So Sabrina, please, if you can. Um, yes, um, so just letting the public know uh, with the streaming in YouTube that we are going to stop the streaming because there's no, there's not a possi technical possibility of streaming the groups, the different groups. So um, we're going to do it separately inside the YouTube. We're going to stop it. And then when we get back, we're going to stream it again. So it's going to be a different streaming, just to let the people know. And, um, and also, uh, I'm going also to stop recording, okay? So let's begin uh, with the creation of the breakout rooms. And uh, I, I'm going to assign it automatically, but then, um, well, well, maybe I can let participants choose the room. What do you think, Anna? I think automatically it's fine because they're just the huh? same, right? Um, okay, so let's so let's, let's just, just see sorry. how it works. No, no, just to make sure that people understand the scheme. I mean, uh, I don't know if everybody has this experience. So uh, we are going. Uh, each one individual is going to be moving to the to the breakout room. So it may take a little bit. Uh, to all the people be inside each one of the rooms. And so be patient with this. And you're going to have special moderators in, in, one, uh, in each one of the rooms. So thank yeah. you again to, to stay with us. So this activity will last about 30 minutes. And uh, so the, the, our main, the, the, the objective, the, our aim is to, to show that you can provide your insights and uh, give your um, uh, points of view. Okay. Yes, so then, then the moderators uh, are going to show uh, your insights by a kind of, you know, wrapping up the, the, the answer and the answers you provided, and then uh, we're going to end the event. So let's assign it. We'll see you back in about 30 minutes. <laughs> 